Welcome to Stego Educational Shorts. Short lectures covering the essentials of key coagulation topics. Presented by world-renowned experts. And designed to fit around your busy schedule. Thanks for joining us at the Stego Educational Short. Today we're joined by Dr. Emanuel Favaloro. He is the Principal Hospital Scientist in the Haematology Department at the Westmead University Hospital Laboratories. He has published hundreds of papers on the topics around the field of hemostasis and thrombosis, and he has a special interest in von Willebrand's disease, which he's going to speak to us about today. I'd like to thank Stego for inviting me to speak on von Willebrand disease, which is my favourite topic, in particular laboratory diagnostics for von Willebrand disease. Um, that's who I am. My name is Emmanuel Favalora. I'm from the Sydney Centres for Thrombosis and Hemostasis at Westmead Hospital in New South Wales. And I'm happy to provide a copy of any of the material that I speak about in this presentation to anybody who requests it. Just uh, send me an email. I shall start the talk uh, just with a basic overview or introduction in regards to the basic principles of hemostasis. Um, very simply, injury will cause a blood loss uh, unless you can mitigate that blood loss. Um, and hemostasis is a, is a process by which uh, the body acts to mitigate the blood loss, essentially by plugging the hole that's caused by the injury. Within the concepts of um, hemostasis, uh, we talk about primary and secondary hemostasis. Within primary hemostasis, what we refer to is the activity of platelets and adhesion of those platelets to the site of injury, uh, and that includes also various adhesion proteins and especially von Willebrand factor. Uh, when we talk about secondary hemostasis, we're talking about clotting, so we talk about the plasma clotting factors. Now, this this is a very convenient process to uh, to consider uh, hemostasis, uh, but it's simplistic. And actually, what happens in uh, vivo uh, is that uh, these uh, processes work in concert and primary and secondary hemostasis is integrated. And in this uh, slide, I'm showing a figure which is just showing a, a cartoon, if you like, of blood flow and an injury to that blood vessel shown as the stars and platelets where the platelets adhere to the site of injury via adhesion proteins, including von Willebrand factor, which is also attaching not only to platelets, but to the subendothelial matrix, in particular collagen. In, in vivo, we have shear stress and the blood flow, which induces platelet adhesion and also von Willebrand factor binding. In this second slide, uh, I will talk a little bit about the basic principles in terms of in vitro. Um, in the tests that we perform in vitro act to try and mimic in vivo hemostasis. Here, the components of hemostasis are separated out using particular reagents and the sample that we, uh, we wish to test, and then we investigate separate pathways of hemostasis. In primary hemostasis, we may wish to assess platelet function uh, or von Willebrand factor tests. Uh, and only within the in vitro tests, the only one that we have that includes flow shear, which is important in vivo, is a PFA. And then we also have tests for secondary hemostasis. Here we talk primarily around, around, a bit, around the routine coagulation tests, such as the performance time, the APTT, and factor assays. And these investigate components of hemostasis, but these assays are not cell-based. And in this figure, I show a picture which just shows an example of what we see in vitro using a platelet function test, uh, where we have a platelet aggregation in response to an agonist, and the various stages of that primary wave of uh, platelet aggregation are shown in the pictures. So A is where we have resting platelets, B where we have uh, activated platelets, C where we have activated platelets starting to stick together, and D where we form a platelet aggregate, and E because this is only a primary wave where we get disaggregation of the platelets. In this third main slide, I, talk, I will talk briefly about the diagnosis of von Willebrand's disease uh, in terms of the components of the diagnosis. Uh, 
So we undertake for patients, firstly, a clinical review where we assess the pa patient's personal and family history of bleeding. Uh, or, uh, and we can do that using uh, either a clinical history or bleeding scores. The clinician undertakes a physical examination of the patient. And then if the patient character is characterised as potentially having a bleeding disorder, including von Willebrand's disease, then laboratory testing may ensue. Here, this is what I'm going to be talking about primarily. Um, and here, what's important is the choice of assays that we utilise, the choice of the methods for those assays that we utilise, and also the assay panels. This includes the number of assays and the type of assays that we include in that panel. It's important also to consider not only the analytical issues in regards to the assays and the types of assays, but also pre-analytical issues. This slide essentially describes the classification of von Willebrand uh, factor disorders, von Willebrand disorders. So these can be either congenital, in which case we call them von Willebrand's disease, or they can be acquired, in which case we call them acquired von Willebrand syndrome. In either condition, there's a deficiency and or defect in von Willebrand factor. The difference between congenital and acquired is that one has a genetic um, has a genetic cause, and the other has a, is acquired through some other primary event. The tests that we use for these two conditions are the same. It's really just the history uh, and the presentation which may differ in these patients. Uh, von Willebrand's disease uh, as a congenital disorder is separated into six types. Type 1, 2A, 2B, 2N, 2M and type 3. There are quantitative deficiencies. These are type 1, which is a partial quantitative deficiency of von Willebrand disease, or von Willebrand factor, sorry, and type 3, which is a total deficiency of von Willebrand factor. In type 1, there's a partial deficiency, but the von Willebrand factor that's present is functionally normal. And then we have four different qualitative defects or types. Um, which may present also with a quantitative deficiency, but not necessarily so. We have type 2A, which is represented by a loss of high molecular weight VWF. Type 2B, which is a hyperadhesive form of von Willebrand factor, uh, which also presents with a loss of high molecular weight VWF and also with a mild thrombocytopenia. Type 2N, which is represented by a loss of factor 8 binding. So von Willebrand factor does not bind to factor 8 very well. Accordingly, we have a loss of factor VIII stability and a loss of factor VIII activity from plasma. And in, in plasma, uh, what we see is a lower level of factor VIII. And then we have type 2M. And a lot of people have difficulty with under, understanding of a type 2M von Willebrand disease. Essentially, this is easiest to, dis, dis, to discern as considering that this is the rest of the disorders. In other words, if you don't have a type 1 you don't have a type 2A, a 2B, or 2N, or type 3, but you have von Willebrand disease, then you must, by definition, have a type 2M. So this is where you have a dysfunctional von Willebrand factor that's not associated with the loss of high molecular weight, VWF. This is my next slide, which talks a little bit about von Willebrand factor. So von Willebrand factor is a large and complex molecule. In plasma, it, it presents as multimers of a core protein. The monomer or the core protein has about, about 2,000 amino acids, um, but the, the multimers actually range in size from about 250 kD to greater than 20,000 kD. Now, each molecule of von Willebrand factor has binding sites for many ligands and it has the same binding sites for these ligands, and these describe the various functions of von Willebrand factor. However, the larger the uh, multimers or the larger the size, the more overall functionality or the more overall binding sites that the molecule has or adhesiveness that the molecule has, and thus the high molecular weight forms of von Willebrand factor are more adhesive or more functional than the intermediate or low molecular weight forms. This is important in terms of understanding the disorder type 2A and 2B von Willebrand's disease, where you may have normal levels of von Willebrand factor but the von Willebrand factor is essentially deficient in high molecular weight forms. Irrespective, if you have absent, deficient or defective von Willebrand factor, as I said, you have von Willebrand disease um, or you have von Willebrand syndrome, acquired von Willebrand syndrome. So in this slide, I'm just showing you a number of potential guidelines that you may actually wish to refer to. Um, these publications um, are, are generally free to download. Uh, but if you have difficulty uh, obtaining these publications, I am happy to share them.
In this slide, I'm showing you um, some potential uh, problems with the lab diagnosis of von Willebrand's disease uh, in terms of pre-analytical issues. So here's a, a slide which just goes you shows you some of the uh, a diagram that shows you some of the um, processes in terms of uh, a diagnosis of von Willebrand disease, uh, and considering that the analytical component is actually a, a small part of that process. And the pre-analytical component, uh, and to some extent the post-analytical component, are also important. So in terms of pre-analytical issues um, in diagnosis of von Willebrand disease, uh, we can start with the clinical request. Uh, for example, if a, pa if a clinician only requests for a particular patient a test for factor VIII, considering that they feel that the patient has hemophilia A, then that investigation may actually miss a von Willebrand disease because the von Willebrand factor tests are not requested or not performed. Uh, the other pre-analytical issues in the main relate to blood, co blood collection artifacts or to uh, blood processing artifacts. In terms of blood collection artifacts, an underfilled tube, for example, will give you a false low level von Willebrand um, and then you can get a false diagnosis of a type 1 von Willebrand's disease. If you collect a serum tube and send off serum instead of plasma, you have a potential false type 2 von Willebrand disease pattern emerging. Uh, often, of, obviously, patients may often may sometimes be misidentified and all the tube may be mislabeled. So we might be doing tests on the wrong patient. Patients may be on anticoagulants. Now, anticoagulants don't affect von Willebrand factor tests very much, but they will affect factor VIII testing. So if you uh, perform a test of von Willebrand disease, uh, diagnosis of von Willebrand factor tests, including factor VIII on patients on anticoagulants, then the factor VIII may give you a false low value, and then you may have either a hemophilia A pattern or a false 2N von Willebrand disease pattern. In terms of processing, sample processing, also can cause a false von Willebrand disease pattern. For example, refrigeration of whole blood, either uh, in part uh, while it's been uh, stored or when it's been transported, can potentially lead to a false type 2 von Willebrand disease pattern. And, of, and also inadequate mixing of a sample, of a plasma sample, after freezing and thawing can also lead to a potential false type 2 von Willebrand disease pattern. So in this slide, I'm just showing you a cartoon of von Willebrand factor, uh, which contains various domains. And each of the domains are important uh, for the functionality of von Willebrand factor. And some of the domains have binding sites for various ligands. For example, the D domains have a binding site for factor VIII. And in terms of the assessment in the laboratory of assessing that interaction between the ligand and von Willebrand factor, we perform a test that's called von Willebrand factor factor VIII binding. The A1 domains is a binding site for glycoprotein 1B on platelets. So that's a major platelet adhesion site. So uh, we, can assess the inter we can assess the interaction between the A1 domain and glycoprotein 1B using various assays, in particular what we call the glycoprotein 1B binding assays, of which the receiving cofactor is a main classical assay that we utilise. But there are other VWF activity assays that we can utilise to do this, uh, such as the VWF ACT assay, an evidence assay um, available from one manufacturer, uh, glycoprotein 1BR, R standing for recombinant, available from another manufacturer, and the VWF glycoprotein 1BM, which is again a mutation assay uh, that can be performed either by ELISA or is, it was essentially equivalent to VWF ACK assay. Uh, by available from one manufacturer. Then there's the A3 domain, which is uh, which can bind to collagen, and we can assess that binding uh, using a collagen binding assay. And then there is the other domains, such as the C domains, uh, which can bind to platelets on glycoprotein 2B3A, uh, which we don't normally measure in the laboratory um, uh, for von Willebrand factor, but can be measured if, uh, in the, if required using a flow or platelet function assay. But I'm going to be focusing on um, the uh, two, uh, two main assays, uh, one being the glycoprotein 1B um, assay, uh, binding assays, and the collagen binding assays. Thank you for your attention. That's the end of part one, and I'll talk more about this
uh, Vulnerable Man Disease Diagnosis. I hope you will join me for part two shortly. <laughs>